Wolf and PMC Emma out of the TAC 20, 100 yards. DPMS, LR308. This is a nut and fancy tabletop review. It's going to be thorough, interesting, and in the end, I think, provide you with a good reference data point. It's taken a long time for these rifles to finally reach the reviewing table. I apologize for the delay. Better late than never. The upside is this. It's now May 2012, and that means I have over five years of shooting the LR308 under my belt. Not just me, crew members as well. Friends as well. I have a lot of data to share with you. I really got serious about shooting the rifle within the last two years specifically for this review in the Nut and Fancy project. And in those last two years, I set out with a very specific objective. To either prove the critics right on the DPMS LR308, and there's lots of them, or to prove them wrong, that it is actually a very viable 308, we'll say for now, battle rifle choice. I think some guys catch some flack for choosing the DPMS LR308. And maybe their tactical elitist buddies will roll in and say, hey man, you know, you need to dump that hobby rifle and upgrade to a Colt 901, LMT MWS, LaRue OBR, LWRC Reaper, maybe even a CAC SR25. Sound familiar if you're a DPMS owner? Well, I'm a DPMS owner. Both of those guns are TMP guns, and I've had them since 2007. Introductions in order, I guess, on the top is what was called the Classic Custom, and I purchased that 07, I think 07, it might have been December 06, actually, from RSR. And it came with a bunch of mods already on it. Word had it when I talked to RSR that it was put together for some government agency They wouldn't tell me who. They had some overages of it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what it was. On the bottom is a TAC-20. Both of them have been Dura-coated. There are some mods right in each one, but essentially these are stock guns. The gas system, gas system hasn't been messed with. The triggers have been changed. I'll tell you why here. But other than that, they're pretty much as they came from the factory. I didn't do, I don't think, anything to the buffer tubes, the springs, as they come. Now I said I was going to be honest, and I am. There, there is some valid negativity that's founded on the DPMS LR308. There have been quality bobbles in the type, I believe, and I know for a fact there's been reliability issues on them. My buddy Bugget Nuster sold his LR308 because for whatever reason, we'll talk about that, he couldn't get it to run right. I want to talk about how these two have ran, and I'm going to, again, give you a good data point on the type. I think you're going to find it interesting. I'm going to be very hard-pressed to make this a single parter. Actually, I was going to do some more epic shoots with this thing before I did this tabletop, but honestly, this video is not going to get that many views anyhow, so I said, what the heck, just put it out there. Let's get it off the reviewing table. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to sh first start talking about models that are currently available. We did a great booth review with DPMS, which is now a subsidiary of Remington. By the way, I hate that. I hate how the Freedom Group is sucking everything in. I just would love these companies to stay separate and independent with their, each, each of, with their own personality. I can't change the world, though. I'm in the 2011 catalog DPMS. Uh, so there's a couple that are they're being produced, and I'm going to just have to talk to. We're going to get into POUs here in a second, and you need to make some decisions if you are choosing a DPMS. 308 of what you want to do with a rifle because it really drives to which one I recommend you buy. And I have a very distinct POU for both of these guns of what I like doing with them. And that's why they're, they're configured the way they are. I have the scope taken off this one. It's right here. Couldn't fit it all in. Okay, here we go. Uh, that's a Reaper right there. I think guys really dig that. You're going to be paying a lot for that. Upgraded stock it's basically the same materials, it's basically the same gun. All these are basically the same gun. They're going to have 6066 T6 aluminum uppers and lowers. Some guys have issues with that. I'll talk about that in durability. There's a Mark 12 for you. That's another option. You can see the recommended pricing on that. 
same guns, you're just getting a different stock, different siding systems. I don't dig this rail so much, by the way, on the Reaper. It's big. Not necessarily light either. These ones are chambered in 308. These are hunting LR-308s, Panthers. They don't have threaded muzzles. They have heavy barrels, like we talked to DPMS there, the rep. They're meant for hunting, and their chambering is 308. The ones on the table are 76251s. That's their chambering. That's what I recommend you get. You'll see why in accuracy. There's a SAS model right there. Again, expensive. You're buying a lot of stuff, uh, you know, on there. PRS stock. You got that target grip, which I generally hate. Fluted barrel, same muzzle device. And then we got the LR LR 308C. I'm trying to look through the viewfinder. There's a couple in there. One that I think you should seriously consider if you want it in the battle rifle POU. I'll tell you why I put it in quotes is the MOE version and that is the uh, MOE mid-length so it has a mid-length gas system on it and yes these are not piston guns they are direct gas impingement guns big AR-15s essentially basically AR-10s is what they are by DPMS okay so there's some choices you're gonna have to make and let's jump into philosophy of use to get this thing cruising and this will kind of get to which models I recommend. And somewhere along the way, I'm going to insert a lot of shooting video because I have a lot of video. Like I said, over the last few years, I've been pulling the trigger on these things. First and foremost is hunting. Hunting, I'll get that out of the way. You want to hunt with your, uh, your rifle. You saw the models there. I think the ones on the table, again, this is a TAC-20. And by the way, they're still making this. And in my philosophy of use, this is my top recommended model, the TAC-20. This is basically the same rifle here. Let me show you the mods, by the way. I'll get to POUs here in a sec. The mods on this one, I wrote them down in 07. There's the price I paid for everything, and that's what it came with. So that's actually a Daniel Defense AR-10-12 light rail on this gun. That's what the Classic Custom came with. Has a JP Match trigger in installed. It came with an Ergo pistol grip. Uh, I think it came with that. I may have thrown that on. SOP mod collapsible stock on this one. I'll show you here. I love that stock, by the way. It is kind of heavy. Panther flash suppressor on both of them. I put PR, PRI BOIS on both of these guns. Uh, at least on this one. I couldn't fit it under the scope on the TAC-20. There you go. And there's optics. LaRue LT-104 30mm mount. Freaking expensive. Leopold Mark 4 3x5 10 and 30. That's got M2 dials on it, by the way, this one. I'm probably going to sell that scope, upgrade to something with more magnification. Back to philosophy of use. Hunting, that's all I'll say about that. Battle rifle. I want to have a 308 battle rifle. I want to have obstacle defeating capabilities. I want to buck the wind better for the longer shots. I want more knockdown power when I connect with the bad guys. To all of that, I will give you a thumbs up with a huge asterisk. Be careful because you're probably not in good enough shape to run a 308. One more shot. What? I'm just being honest with you guys. I've run and gunned with these things and they're freaking massive. They're heavy. Even the 16 inch barreled ones. These are running 20s. Both of these. 20 inch barrels here, here. Again, for my POU. I like it. The magazines are heavy. The ammo's heavy. It wears you out. I've seen my crew members running with it in the sledgehammer. I saw Troy Industries run it. Matt came out in December 2011. What a great shoot that was, by the way. I'll throw a link right now. Look in the upper right. You can go watch that. And we're running and gunning with the TAC-20 on the bottom here. It's going to exhaust you. Some guys are so detached from the weight realities of upgrading to a 308. I just want to make you aware of them. I mean, the magazine alone, the steel one, is 8 ounces empty. Now, the, uh, the P-Mags, which was, this one has, is going to be a little bit lighter at 5.8 ounces. Just be aware, guys. That's all I'm saying. It is not a primary battle rifle for me. Not at all. I will go 5.56. Five, I can carry more rounds. I can upgrade to a heavier bullet if I need to step it out some. I'll run some 75s, 69 grains. Heck, even 55s do great out to what I consider a realistic range of 300 yards. I think some guys want it, but they want it because they just haven't got out and ran it. There's a reason why the military does not use a 7.62.51 as their primary battle rifle. 
I'll leave it at that. Tar target competition. You want to go out and shoot. You're in some type of carving course, running it, competing with it. And I think this is is actually going to be the best oh, test for the rifle. And I have heard of failures of the type. But you know what? I've heard of failures house. for every type of AR-10 in that philosophy of use. Every brand having problems, parts, breakages, going down. Sometimes there's a backstory to that. In other words, the user has swapped parts out from the factory. That comes out in the end as people are trying to figure out what's going on with the gun. He's like, well, yeah, I put an AR-15 buffer in it. Or something stupid, you know? And so it's really not the manufacturer's fault. But in a carving course, Solid. I think you could use it. Will it be absolutely durable for you? I don't know. I'm not rich to run it to that length. I'm talking day in, day out. I have heard reports of guys running this 200, 300 rounds a day in carving courses just fine. Usually that's the AP4 model, and I forgot to mention that. That's probably their most popular model of the LR308. Here comes my philosophy of use, and that's why these rifles are set up the way they're set up. Now, the act... The acronym the military uses is SAS, Semi-Automatic Sniper System. I've Hit. never used that. No, I'm not trying to be special. Long before the Night Fancy Project, uh, Bugget Nestor and myself, uh, I've always used with him at least, Sapper, Semi-Automatic Precision Rifle. To me, that includes the 308 calibers and also the 556 calibers. What I want this rifle to do for me is to be a long-range, fast-firing semi-auto platform. Anti-vehicle, anti-personnel, if and when I ever had to do that. That's right. Sapper. That's what this rifle is. And for that philosophy of use, I'm going to accept the extra weight. Okay, It's not a gun that I'm going to run and gun with normally. It's going to be, hey, this is something I need a sapper for. I'm going to be shooting out to 800 meters. Yeah. I need something that can get it done, and I, I don't want a bolt Miss. gun in that philosophy of use. This fires a lot more, a lot faster, quicker reloads, and it's just about as accurate, if not more accurate, depending on which bolt you're throwing up at it. You're throwing it up against. 20-inch barrel is preferred by me in that philosophy of use. 18 would be almost ideal. Great velocity, not a ton of blast. 18s are perfect. 20, I'll take it. It does add a heck of a lot of weight. The Sapper philosophy of use, I think, is fascinating. It's basically what the military is using it for. I mean, they call it SAS again, but it's the same philosophy of use. Exactly the same. They're using the M110s out there. There you go. That's as I see it. I got a cruise. Philosophies of use. Innovation in design. There you go. I'm going to break open this catalog. I have them all stacked up. This is one I would think about getting... I'm not just like myopic on DPMS. I can't afford to be. I'm a reviewer. This is something that merits your attention. The AR-10A4 SPR. I looked at that years ago. I'm talking like in the late 90s. I came very close to buying one just like this one. I think that's a great gun, even though they're, they're claiming only one and a half to two MOA. I think you could beat that out of an arm light. In the comments, I guarantee you, you're going to see some AR-10 guys weigh in. They'll tell you... Um, what they're getting and be you know be open-minded. We're just exchanging information is all I think that's a great gun So innovation and design it's following the Armalite AR-10 with DPMS's <coughs> Remington's own spin on it Some guys will make and I'll, I'll roll in materials and quality right here, too Some guys will make a big deal about um, the choice of 6066 T6 aluminum and in some ways I'm sympathetic because I too am a fan of forged 7075. Lost my talking point, so I'll just have to just wing it. I'd prefer it too. That being said, I haven't seen any problems with the 6066 at all. Again, keep in mind my rounds counts. I'm not in the thousands. I can't afford it. But I'm well above a thousand between the two between the two guns. I didn't really keep track. Maybe, uh, you know, getting close to 1,500, 1,600 rounds, thereabouts, over a span of time. And that's not including other LR-308s that have been run in the project. No problems. I haven't seen any durability problems at all. These things are thick. They're thick-walled. Uh, extruded top, I believe. Extruded aluminum top. Some guys will have issue with that. 
I'm on board with 7075 at a price point. In other words, if I can get another gun at 7075 price point, same price point, I'll go. I'm 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 digging it. The receiver fit between these two is insane when we talk about innovation design. I'm talking it's the tightest I've I've seen in any AR pattern rifle. I have this one partially, this classic custom partially taken down. The pin out. And I also have the bolt out because I'm going to show you that later. See if I can pull this out. The pin is tight. I mean it is a mother to get out. I need a pin to do it. Yeah, that's tight. Finally got it. Here we go. So snug fit between the upper and lower, that's exactly what I want. Good job, DPMS. We're on the inside now. Great time to talk about the trigger. Both of these have been replaced. This gun has a JP. I don't know who installed that. Factory, some other supplier en route, don't know. It is outstanding. JP triggers, by the way, are difficult to install. I tried it myself, screwed it up, had to redo it, finally got it right. Um, they're kind of a gunsmith trigger, though. Once you get them right, they're excellent. They do have some adjustment screws in there. I highly recommend you Loctite those if you're going to use your rifle for serious purposes, if you know what I mean. Looking on the upper receiver, I don't know if I can give you the angle on this. It has some milling there right at the barrel, kind of some M4 feed ramps. I'm probably not showing you. It's almost impossible to wrangle this big rifle. I like that standard dust cover on this version, forward assist on this version. I wouldn't mind running a slick sided LR308 at all, it would save me just a couple ounces. I've never used the forward assist in this rifle or for that matter any AR-15. Okay, so that's the, the upper and lower and again I think the best way to demonstrate their fit, we'll get to the bolt here in just a sec, is by how much force it takes to put that takedown pin in. And it's a lot. I'm not going to push it all the way just in case we need to get inside again. Let's go to the bolt. AR-10, man. Analogous to an M16 bolt. This one is made out of 8620 steel. I think it's chrome lined on the inside as well, DPMS carriers. It is not MPI. Not shot peened. I can guarantee you that. They would brag about it. At this price point, you're just not going to get that. You're going to be in probably the two plus $2,500 price range to get that, to get all those mil spec features with this size bolt. There's a staking of the gas key. <clears throat> Excuse me, the gas key. Saw no issues with gas le leakage of any kind on these guns. No bolt breakages, but then again, consider how I ran the guns. Just like Sledgehammer, it's going to be probably. 30 rounds, let the gun cool. 30 rounds, let the gun cool. The real test is semi-auto semi firing, mag dump after mag dump. Oh wait, I did do that. And that stupid video I did, Sniper Prime, which gun did I use for that? I think it was this one, before it was Duracoated. That's right, I did rock and roll that, and I shot Wolf. And I did like three mag dumps with it, as fast as I could pull the trigger. That was when I was getting serious about my personal testing. I had started TMP then, but I wanted to know, can this gun take it? Me and Sadly Missing went out and I, I just slammed it. I'll see if I can find that footage. I hope I have it because the gun didn't malfunction once with underpowered and dirty wolf ammo. Okay, innovation and design. I already said it's 762 51 chambering. Proprietary pieces, that's pretty standard for all AR-10 style of rifles. In other words, Bolts probably won't swap between rifles. The magazines will. It's an SR25 LR308 magazine. And by the way, that's my favorite of the type. 19, 20 rounds. There's your firepower philosophy or talking point. Love the coating on that. I'll take you to the business end now. There's that Panther flash hider, and I love it. Haven't seen a need to replace it, actually. It is a flash hider, not a compensator, and you kind of know it when you shoot the LR-308, at least if your version has this on there. There's a lot of reciprocating mass in this gun. It is an AR-10 after all. You might be able to mitigate some of that recoil, that movement, with a good compensator. I think somewhere along the road, I'm going to throw a battle comp on it. Expensive. 
or the more affordable, and I think, I don't know yet, awesome Troy Medieval or Claymore muzzle brake. Easy enough to do. It's a 5 8 by 24 thread pattern. You can even throw a suppressor on there. There's the barrel. In my mind, that is a perfect barrel profile for my philosophy of use of Sapper. That's why I spent some time on that. That thing is like artillery thick under the handguard. And it's made out of 4140 steel, not 4150, which would be more expensive and more preferred. And it's not chrome lined. Six groove, one and ten twist. This one came with, came with a fixed front sight on it. I took it off. That's a PRI low profile gas block on there, pinned under the barrel. You can see I've taken it off and on a couple times, so I've worn the dirt coat away. Then you can see the marking of the barrel, 76251, one and ten twist. I like this profile uh, this low profile gas block. I've heard some discussions how they guys don't like this, that it will loosen up on them. I even heard one discussion where the guy said it'll actually bulge the barrel, the these screws on the bottom. I'm sorry, I just haven't seen that. I haven't seen it loosening on any of my gas blocks that are pinned that way. I do lock tight them. That's the barrel. This is a proprietary rail put on the TAC 20. It's heavy. One of these days, I'm going to put this sucker on. In fact, one of these days, very soon, I'm going to put this on, and it's going to save a lot. This is a Troy TRX battle rail, and it is awesome. Low profile, lower than this, and it's really going to help the gun's weight. That being said, I still love the TAC-20, because until you have money to upgrade the rail, this one will work fine. Remember the philosophy of use. It is a 308 battle rifle. To this day, I've not seen one very light. And I will include the Keltec RFB in that criticism. That's almost nine pounds naked. So there you go. I'm all for making it light myself, but you know, there's that old philosophy discussion here in the Nut Fancy Project: firepower versus mobility. You want a 308 battle rifle with current technologies? it's probably going to be heavy. And I say probably because there are some exceptions out there, namely the FN-17S. But the way they do it, I'm talking making it lighter, is they get away with a very skinny barrel. I've shot that gun. I love it. But it has a much skinnier barrel. It'll heat up quicker than this. It'll affect accuracy. I don't know. I haven't tested it to that degree yet. Okay, innovation design, materials and quality. This is, again, an anodized upper and lower and then they Teflon coat it I'm talking DPMS and you wouldn't know it by looking at my Duracoated guns it's actually a smooth black finish I liked it but not enough to stay with it because of my philosophy of use Sapper my area of operations it might be the desert it looks cool definitely and it runs cooler being Duracoated it's not black soaking up that desert heat but more importantly it breaks up the image because a big black rifle is extremely visible out there. I mean, you can see it a long ways away. It's just unnatural. That's why both these guns are riding in camo. You know, your mileage may vary. The rest is pretty much standard AR-15, and it will take standard AR accessories. I mean, I've got a Myad grip on this one. That's probably still my overall favorite grip, or the MOE, same thing, love it. And I'm just running a standard A2 stock on this, which I like. I'm not a huge fan of the Magpul PRS. It's just too heavy for me. This is cost effective and I haven't had a need to swap it out. I don't think I ever will because of the philosophy of use of this gun. It's not a, an urban fighting machine for me. It is wide open spaces, precision rifle. Same with the one on the back. Now this one, the classic custom, like I said, comes with a SOP mod and I do love this stock. No need to swap it out. It's very stable, not exactly lightweight. You need to understand something about my guns, and I, I don't do this just for TMP. While I'm reviewing, I'm also perfecting my own system. So as you see these guns outfitted, that's how I run them. That's what I want. Like the PRI sights on them, muzzle devices, the rails, everything. And I'll explain, you know, as I go along. Now this scope on here is a Nikon Buckmasters 4.5 to, what is it, 14, I think. Good scope, mill dot, it's not an outstanding scope. The field of view is a little bit limited on it. And honestly, for the philosophy of use of Sapper, it doesn't have enough magnification. Those are PRI rings with polymer inserts since that's a one inch tube scope. Butler Creep scope caps, suck. Hate these things. They won't stay closed, they break on me all the time. 
like that. Right now, they're just not staying closed. Uh, they really need to get their act together. That's about it. Um, I think it has uh, on the buffer tube, I think it's a mill tube in the back. And as it comes from the factory, I really wouldn't swap it out. I'm talking uh, your spring, your buffer tube. Now, if you want to fit uh, a carbon style stock or retracting stock on there, you may have to do something with that. Be very careful. You use AR10 specific components. I'm talking springs and buffers. With the ones I have set in here, I've had no problems at all. Whew. On to our ergonomics. AR15, standard stuff. I talked about the recoil. It's substantial, but I don't find it unmanageable, and that's without a muzzle brake on it. Watch the footage as Matt and I are running it in Sledgehammer there for the Troy Industries shoot. I mean, they're on target, and this gun ruled the day. I mean, some of the highest scores that day were put down by that TAC-20 right in front of you. Awesome gun. Ergonomically speaking, it's heavy. You're going to have to deal with that. There's some things you can do to lighten them up. There's information out there if that's what you're after. Is if that's what you really want to do. Be careful not to destroy their reliability. Firepower. 19 or 20 rounds. Um, there's been huge discussions about the magazine problems interfacing with the DPMS LR308. The interesting part is these are circa 2007 guns, both of them. They actually have the high receiver. If you go to the Troy website, uh, when you get your battle rail from them, use the nut and fancy discount code, by the way, if you do that. I sure do. So both of these are old style DPMS receivers. In regards to firepower, with all the magazines I used, and that is including the PMAG 20 round 20LR, this one right here, the factory DPMS circa 2007, there were some changes I understand, or the C products SR25 LR308 magazine, I had exactly zero problems. None. They all worked great. And 20 rounds is the firepower. 19 depending on which magazine you're using. And that is substantial for the caliber. Very substantial. On par with all the other competitive offerings as well. And on we go to a very interesting segment of the video, reliability and durability. We had a probably, let's see, five LR308s run in the test for the Nut and Fancy project. Uh, one was an AP4 by sadly missing. I didn't shoot that gun, he did. Ran it in Sledgehammer. I have been showing you the video on that and it was pretty much reliable. I say pretty much because there was one day we went out and he was having some reliability problems. It wasn't, I forget, I'd have to look at the video, you guys will see it. Was it chambering all the way? Uh, I think it was just failing to strip off the next round. I think he was getting good extraction failing to strip, so maybe under gassed. Or it might be because he put different springs and buffers in his car stock and he did do some swapping out so it was not this is a very important point I want you guys to get it was not a stock AP4 now bug at Nuster's gun had some reliability issues I mentioned that already he was mostly shooting reloads and I actually shot some reloads in here too and I think I've shot this gun for so long it's hard to remember I think I did have a failure to extract with my reloads several times getting back to that tight chamber of the LR308. Uh, I will just say it, I don't recommend you shoot reloads in the guns if you want maximum rel reliability. I really don't. I think you should just shoot a factory load and call it good. Watch the comments, you're going to see some really good guys, smart guys that are shooting reloads and they'll be able to give you some data what they do to make it reliable on their LR308s. This, like all nut and fancy vids, will be a clearinghouse for the type. You won't have to waste time searching forums. Over the years, I anticipate, you can just come to this video and see guys improve my data point that I'm giving you. And all I can do is my experience. Overall, these two guns on the table were amazingly reliable for me. I'm just telling you straight up. With Steelcase Wolf, again, all kinds of loads, Federal, American Eagle, Ultramax, which is remanufactured ammunition, they were great. I mean... Bugget would call me up and he's having problems with his. He's like, dude, what? Are you, how are yours running? I'm like, they're running great. I don't know what to tell you, dude. I mean, I'm running it in Sledgehammer. I'm running it in some you know, other courses I've set up. I'm shooting it at the range. I just I haven't had a problem. 
Um, if I did, you know, they're getting sold. And honestly, at this point, I'm not planning on selling the guns. They're serving the role. This is a good time to talk about competitive option, options. And there's, there'll be discussion. Well, it's not a mil-spec rifle. <clears throat> I've already talked about mil-spec a lot. How it's so overblown, oversold. I like the quality levels, but not all this other stuff that comes along with it. And it's just not to the level of the other guns I mentioned. You know, the SR-25, maybe the LMT MWS, which I hear a lot about. And I would agree with that. Those guns are higher quality. They're using higher end materials. There's probably some better quality processes, but you're also paying for it. Okay, the LMT MWS is, what is that, like $3,400? $3,400? $3, I don't think it's going to shoot any more accurately than this, and it's also 10 pounds. Elaru OBR, same weight. That's a 16 inch barrel, 9 and a quarter pounds, and it's $3,000. The Larue OBR, so it's double the price of this gun. The question you have to ask yourself is it double the reliability? Is it double the durability? And I would say no, from my data point. To make that data point more righteous, however, I would have to shoot a lot of rounds personally, spend a lot of money like I have done with this, these guns to make it tight. And then I could really speak with some authority. I've done a lot of studying, reading, heard a lot of things, but I've also heard failures of those other guns as well. Quality problems with those other guns. And I'm just broad stroking it. Reliability and durability is excellent. Keep in mind it's an AR-10 variety of rifle and I've heard a lot of problems with AR-10s going down and I think that's really going to happen if you're shooting them a lot. The military specification on the M110 says what do they shoot like 20 rounds within a span of time. It's not designed as a firefight rifle and yes even with the Knight's armaments there have been problems. Lots of problems and that is what a $5,000 rifle? So when guys get on the bandwagon and they're beating up on DPMS, I'm like, well, I don't see anybody being much better from the data that I've seen. Maybe if you really want the quality levels, be ready to pony up, buy it. So far, so good on to accuracy. I've got a lot of targets to show you guys, too. I'm kind of embarrassed on some, some of them because I've seen guys shoot one hole with these, these guns. Here we go. This is the TAC-20 at the bottom. This is uh, December 2011, 30 degrees outside, and that's that XM-762, replaced now by the XM-80 by Federal. That's my favorite load for the gun. Mil-spec round. There's some Ultramac, Ultramax 168s. That's that remanufactured ammunition. Got a little bit of a flyer thing going on here. I'm not going to stay for bench resters. These are super impressive, but for out in the desert, for me, I'm happy with them. It's a one MOA rifle, easily one MOA. There's a wider group with SM762. Here's 50 yards. This is the classic custom. This one in the back, 50 yards wolf. Holy freak, that's good. No, it's just 50 yards, but still, there's another one. Look at this group, dude, seriously. Wolf, 150 grain steel case, that, that is excellent. Little flyer going on here. This was one round and then it comes into that group, so that one's a little bit bigger. This is a TAC-20 with Wolf. They're accurate, very accurate. Another one, Wolf. Which in all the running guns, that's what I was shooting Wolf. I shot plenty of brass too, but in the running guns, mostly Wolf. I shot American Eagle and some Federal too. Going back to July 2011, I told you I've been shooting this a while. Here's XM762s at 100 yards. I think there was some wind that day too, and a lot of it. That one opened up a lot. Great group. Good group. Good group. Good group. This is a classic custom, number one. Wolf at 100 yards. PMC it did not like. There's a PMC group kind of all over the place and these are good shots. Now I varied on how I'd rest the rifle. On some of these I was resting just on the carpeted rest. Then I had a polymer rest and then I had that preferred DFT which is an awesome shooting platform. 100 yards, TAC-20, Wolf, shut up. Gosh. I'm not gonna say other guns out there like the OBR are not accurate. I think they're phenomenally accurate and they're excellent guns. So don't misinterpret. I'm just saying they're more expensive. 
but I'm pretty happy with the accuracy out of both of these rifles. PMC again, not so much. Not so much. Uh, so, and by the way, PMC, I don't know if it's a super consistent load. Uh, not so much. Here's PMC again. This is a 20 mile an hour crosswind off a carpeted rest. I'll show you footage of that. The wind was cranking that day. Horrible group. That's, again, might be some of me because of my choice of rest. Not super stable. Same, same day, same rest. I forgot to bring a rest that day. It's so funny. Honey Shack, 168 grain Amax. Good group. Little horizontal dispersion there. That's a 700p shot the same day. So it's a shooting as good as a 700p off, out of those conditions. And off the same trigger finger being me. Great group there. Great group there. Now I'm saying great for me. Again, guys are shooting one holes with these. Guys are taking time to work their hand loads, those that do. And they're getting one holes. But I'm for a semi-automatic, oh wait, that's a 700 I'm showing you. I, I put it in the stack though because I'm showing you that it's basically the same accuracy. And that's a 700 SPS shooting a... XM762 and PMC, so it's also dispersing. So that's the round. Accuracy is outstanding for the LR308. There's your bottom line. Outstanding. Uh, again, I recommend factory loads. 168s are my grain of choice. They fit in the magazine well. They run great. They shoot excellent. They have a little bit better BC when you reach out a little bit. That's just me. Field strip. I ain't gonna spend much time on this. We already took the rifle apart, showed you. It's standard AR-15. I will say this though, run that sucker wet. I'm using Militech or Slip 2000 these days. Wet through here, a little drop in the carrier key, just like uh, the military instructions taught you when you're in the service. Run it wet right here on the back. There you go, accessories. Standard AR-15, I like the TAC-20 as it's outfitted. Again, that rail's there. I think it came with a standard A2 grip that's easy enough and very economical to swap out. I like the A2 stock. You can do whatever you want. Again, I'll just drive this home. If you start messing around with the buffer spring, the buffer itself, make sure you know what you're doing. Get the right combination. I would try to get the model you want from DPMS and just leave it and just do minor changes to it like trigger by the way the trigger in this one I didn't mention it I'm so glad I remembered is a Wilson combat TTU tactical trigger unit and it is a modular drop-in trigger love it it is expensive it is awesome um, now I love chip McCormick's too the Rock Rivers are excellent they're high value the JP's if you can get them installed also excellent there you go get the model you want the Reaper, don't like the stock, don't like that front end, and I wouldn't pay for it, and you are going to pay for it. A lot. That MOE would be my top one. It's not in this catalog, but the MOE mid-length. Because then you can run the mid-length when you really want to get it accurate. Take that mid-length off. I'm talking, I'm sorry, take that MOE handguard, MOE handguard off. Put on a Troy rail, call it good. I think it is a 16-inch barrel. I prefer 18s in my philosophy of use. That's all I'm going to say on accessories. By the way, this is a Ares Armor Sling, I think, in ATAX. Really nice sling. Value. It's leading the pack in a lot of ways for AR-10 style rifles. I'm talking the LR-308. There are some excellent competitive options. We've been talking about them throughout the whole video. One I didn't mention yet is this. The M1A series. It is old school. And one thing that motivated me to upgrade to an AR-10 style rifle is the optics mounting problems that I incurred with my M1A back in the 90s. It's a hassle, need a cheek rest. Uh, I had some wandering zero problems with that particular rifle. I will review the M1A again. It's a great option though and it's very proven. I love the grand action. Go watch my grand video and you'll see me just basically falling in love with it on camera all over. There's a Remington. That's a DPMS rifle because Remington owns DPMS. That's called the R25. It's a hunting rifle. Not threaded. Just as heavy. Same materials. I think we're going to have a 6000 series aluminum. I don't like the hunting versions. I want a threaded muscle if I ever want to throw a can on it. And I want pick rails. I want to throw light side mounted slings, which this one has. Not preferred. 
How about Rock River? Toots, I love Rock River stuff. I don't have experience with their LAR 8, so I think this one would be very fascinating. I think they're all 16 inch barrels, unfortunately, though. That's a mid length A4. That'd be a good option. So those could be good. And they are manufacturing their new foul mags, polymer foul mags. Again, my favorite magazine is this one right here. Proven. I've had great experience with it. Here comes a Bushmaster option. There's an optics ready carbine. I think most guys run these as battle rifles, not as sappers. They don't. And then you've seen it shot in front of the team from camera. I've got a fair amount of trigger time on it. RFB. That's out of the American Rifle, American Rifleman magazine. Hope your NRA membership is current, by the way. RFBs are cool. 16-inch barrel. They got a 20-inch barrel now. They're reliable if you get good magazines. We had some chokes with RFB in the sledgehammer in 2011 when Keltec came out. Probably attributed to magazines. They are lighter by just a smidgen. Still basically nine pounds. When I read articles, they just kind of summarize it for me. There's value. I think, I'm not even going to say a price, but they're going to be lower than the other options except the RFB. Actually, maybe the RFB will be more. I didn't check. Track record. The whole video has been about track record for me. It's been a great gun here for me personally, and then when I started TMP, great guns. Would you bet your life on it? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I would like to have higher quality materials in the gun, but I don't know if I'm ready to go out and spend three grand on a 308 sapper. You might be. I don't know. Everybody's different on how they do it. Um, but for me, it's been a great gun. It's been extremely accurate. It's kind of a go-to rifle. I don't have a crystal ball, though. I don't have a way to predict the future on these two guns on the table. Maybe down the road they begin to suck. Maybe they start having problems. Maybe I have parts breakages. Go. To test 308 rifles is expensive. And with all the other projects, uh, you know, time consuming. So I, I did the best I could. I gave you five years worth and a lot of rounds shot between the two guns. That's the Nut Fancy Review. I highly recommend the DPMS rifles. Get your favorite flavor. Mod it as necessary. Be very smart in how you modify it. If you have problems, send it back to the factory. That's a Nut Fancy Review out. I'm getting flare, whoever's like that is. There you go, that's better. Five more. Nice job. One more. That was a hit, wasn't it? Yep. yep. Seven out of nine. Hey, nice. Nice job. Well, it'll be interesting to see how much of that run we got. Camp, camera shut off. Oh no! Crap. Yeah, I tried to turn it back on twice. Ah, oh, suck. Yep, It'd just down. be running along and then all of a sudden it would just shut off completely. The battery terminal, probably. Something. Did you get that 200 yards? Stage? Yeah, I got all that. <sighs> suck. That was a clean run. That was awesome. Good run. Hopefully we got most of it. Okay. Well, crap happened. Especially when it's 10 degrees out here. Exactly. Let's see how 35 went. 
Yeah, I felt good about it. I'm pretty sure we're outside the operating range of your, uh, <laughs> the temperature for the camera. The approved temperature range? Yep. Running that TK21 on here. Yeah, that's good. So far, so good. It wasn't switching modes. Nope. Nice. I don't see any hits in the nine ring though. Uh, <laughs> cameraman needs to remind me. <laughs> I'm just doing good just to keep the camera on. I know. Nice Attack job. 20 is running 100 percent. Yep. It's 17 degrees out. Wolf ammo. Look at the magazine. It's all frosted over. Deadly accurate. Good job. Thanks, brother. Whew. Clean run with that sucker. This thing's been my gun all day long. The DP Mass TAC 20. Love it. Just love it. So we're running a uh, Wilson Combat TTU, Tactical Trigger Unit. that is just phenomenal. Love it. It's really an expensive trigger unit, but man, is it excellent. Good deal. Thanks, man.